Hi, my name is Adam Pearson. I am a presenter, producer, actor, campaigner, jack of all trades, master of none, representing the, and I, uh, Master Bunny is, disabled community. Where if you're not getting it right off screen, you're never going to get it right on screen because you don't have the right voices feeding in to the ecosystem to help solve the, the issue. <clears throat> and it comes back to the old adage, nothing about us without us. So I really put my, my um, foot on the gas with, with that because my line manager was the diversity editorial exec, Mary Fitzpatrick, who I, I owe a great deal of my my success to. And then when my contract ended, I, I made friends with a lot of the um, powerful people. Um, one of whom was Danny Cohen, then the head of BBC Three, and now is, um, to all intents and purposes, a wizard in the, the film industry. The, the guy's a genius. I, I love him to bits. Who sent me to his friend's indie for a two week work experience in development but then became two months and then went on and on and on. And I, I kind of worked on a lot of things around disability or that were disability focused. Not because I, I was being pigeonholed, but because I have the lived experience, which gives you a certain level of authority and expertise that other people just don't have. And, and to work on those kind of things, again, it comes down to picking battles. The Undateables, not the title I would have chosen for a Channel 4 dating show, but then by the same token, if you're going to challenge misconceptions, you first of all need to establish they exist. And I think using um, provocative titles is a very um, on-the-nose way of, of doing that, and a very head-on way of doing that. And I think if you're going to talk about visceral subjects, it's important you do it in a manner that, that matches so. And a lot of people are like, disabled people aren't on data. I, I know that's not what we're saying. If that, were, if that is what we're saying, then us filming disabled people dating and falling in love is a massive misstep on our part. So, and a lot of people that complain about it didn't really watch it or had any interest in watching it. And there's this younger generation of um, advocates who, whilst I have no doubt it's very well intentioned, just like to have a go. And it's a case of, again, picking your battles, taking a step back and having an informed opinion. And I think the social media has made everyone really shotgun in how they conduct their advocacy. They see something they don't like and they tweet about it straight away in two characters or less, rather than taking a step back, rereading it or maybe doing a little bit a little bit more reading around the uh, subject matter. And and Datables came out at sort of like the dawn of Twitter. The, the and and slowly got more and more traction on, on both sides, but everyone that we certainly work with and cast on it were treated thoroughly respectfully, were psych assessed before they were put on TV. The word exploitation gets thrown around a lot, but the word exploitation is just another word for, for use. <clears throat> like if we look at it from like an etymological point of view, I'm exploiting my skills right now. That doesn't mean I'm doing it under under duress or without um, an economic structure in place. And I think when we use it, we harken back to the um, the olden times. But I think to be exploited, you need to feel exploited. And after that, I did a lot of documentary work on things like um, hate crime, um, Adam Pearce on the ugly faces, this wicked hate crime the history of Vaudeville in Adam Pearson Freak Show, eugenics, um, eugenic science's greatest scandal. I, I, I like my, my heavy topics and looking at things that often don't get discussed and discussing them in a way that's accessible, has a lightness of touch, does the subject matter justice, but also bring that little bit of Adam Pearson je ne sais quoi to, to the whole thing. 
which is what really draws people in. I, I always think people don't like being told what to think or what to believe, and good documentaries will change what you think. I have no interest in that. I want to make great documentaries that change how people think, because changing how people think is way more sustainable than changing what they think. I think now people are starting to pay a lot more attention to, to lived experience and, and making sure that the voices they're trying to represent on screen are equally heard off screen. And it's really obvious when they aren't as well. There are certain like little pitfalls that people fall into, particularly with, with disability. So um, slow motion black and white footage, that's a red flag. Um, Coldplay fix you playing in the background, that's a red flag. So and so suffers from so and so, that that's a red flag. But those sort of um, tropes are slowly but surely dying out, and and rightly so. And also, the representation is becoming um, more incidental. The idea that um, disabled people on telly can only do like disabled stuff, and like, well, point point one, what's disabled stuff, and also the um the shorthand of victimhood or villainy or heroism are slowly but surely um falling away. The idea that oh this person's disabled, therefore they're an arsehole. And I think kind of what happened, you know, disabled, um, arsehole because disabled, but that's not a thing. Arsehole and disabled, very much a thing, how are you doing? And it all comes down to better writing, which is better Austrian representation, which is more disabled voices being given the opportunity to tell their own stories and have their voices heard. And that that's the real, the real crux of it is the equality of opportunity, not outcome, those are two very different things. And for years we've been sat in rooms with execs going, where are all the disabled writers? Just like, well, they're, they're here. Well, there are no disabled writers. Well, who's, who's thought that? It's not, it's not disabled people not busting their balls off trying to get their foot in the door. It's just we've got a 20 year history of systemically ignoring them and not giving them the opportunity and now we're in a position where that's slowly but surely starting to happen i still think we're about a decade behind our um fame counterparts but we're slowly but surely uh, catching up and, and on, on that note i don't really like this um pigeonholing of protected characteristics not pigeonholing that's the wrong word to use but it's sort of like box filling and box ticking because once you do that <coughs> once you go okay so just disabled over here lgtbq plus over here um bame over here and everything else over here you instantly take away any intersectionality conversation that can happen <coughs> like where where did the, you know with that where did the asian lesbians go where does the black disabled guy go where does the, um, the non-binary mixed-race individual go? If that's the structure that we're, we're going to use, it's why I loathe the diamond scheme with a burning fury. Whenever they send me the phone, like, I'm not finishing <laughs> at all. I want to get to a point where we can cast disabled actors in roles that originally weren't written as a disabled character. Where a disabled person can play a character that was written as like a banker and not a disabled banker. Where disability isn't the prerequisite for them, for them being there. I, I don't get cast in things because I'm, I'm a disabled actor. I get cast in things because I'm a bloody good actor. Who just happens to be disabled. It isn't it isn't the qualifier and it isn't the disqualifier. It's just part of who I am. And it's a very small part of who I am as well. I often say to people, um, unless you're a geneticist and my disability is the least interesting thing about me. 
if you're a geneticist and don't like fucking fascinating rock and roll. But no, my <coughs> my, my girlfriend's not with me because I'm I'm disabled. She's with me because I have a thing. No, I'm not. Cause, well, I do, but that's not why she's with me. I'm with me because I'm I'm funny, I'm charming, I'm kind, I'm a massive nerd. I have friends who own restaurants. That's a kicker. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's something I rarely think about and rarely discuss. Out outside of the the consultancy game. I've never been to dinner with the girlfriend, and she's gone so disability. It's never happened. <laughs> the same representation I hate is the false heroism narrative. Like in, in the movie um, Wonder, at the end he gets like an award from his school for being disabled and not offing himself. And I, I'm like, oh, okay, that's um, not, not helpful. Or the, um, the villainy, horror, um, sort of like Lynchian, and what was it's a great film, I also know that it was made in a different era, like in the 80s. Um, I think The Elephant Man, and it is a biopic with a lot of historic inaccuracies, that kind of portrayal, when it's done in 2023 would wind me up. There was a film in 2010 called Beastly that had a go, and it, it's just awful. It's widely regarded as a, as a bad film. I, I know it's low-hanging fruit, because it's already been kicked to, to death, and there's that Simpsons meme, stop it, stop it, he's already dead. But serious film music is not good. It's a bad representation of um, autism. It shows chrome restraint, there's a lot of bright, flashy scenes with heavy jump cuts. So really, the community it's trying to represent are unable to watch it because it's too much going on at once. Um, good representation. And this is a really weird answer, but try and stay with me. Todd Browning's film, Freaks, from like the 1930s, is great. It uses disabled actors before it was even a legal requirement. Unfortunately, it got completely bastardised on the cutting room floor when non-disabled people got involved. But yeah, I think it's a masterpiece in, in disabled filmmaking. And also, anything I'm in, go. <laughs> so the grumpy kids, me and some friends started a podcast during in lockdown. Um, more because boredom and loneliness were just a real thing for those like year and a half, two years. And then it inadvertently became one of the most listened to disability, <clears throat> in massive air quotes, podcasts on, on the internet. And whilst it's something we touch on, it isn't the, the raison d'etre. So we, we talk about things like um, the new power slap thing that Dana White's doing, um, we had a chat about Andrew Tate, we talked about The Apprentice, um, I hate The Apprentice, um, as a business economics credit it offends me. Um, we talked about what's the best fast food place to, to eat at, we interviewed Paralympians, we had um, Tremonti from the band Alter Bridge on, so whilst disability is still, still there, we talk about other things as well. It's, it's a podcast that talks about disability rather than being a disability podcast, which is a really healthy um, transition to, to be making. So I still get to flex the expertise um, a little bit, but we also get to talk about things we want to and exist on our own merits more than maybe I have done, have done in the past. I get to sit down and, <clears throat> and you know, talk about like the things I like, like Lego, Magic Gathering, um, Pokemon. Um, I'm a growing up, I swear. And yeah, it, it's good. And um, I love the other guys that I work with. It's, it's, I've made three great friends from, from doing it. And, and hopefully seeing that kind of normalised representation. Um, <clears throat> it, we're changing the world one episode at a time, is, is what I often say. And often with um, advocacy, you want to fix the world straight away. 
and there are times when you feel like a drop in the ocean. And you have to remind yourself that without all those drops, there's no ocean. So yeah, we'll, <coughs> we'll, we'll get there. Um, subscribe on YouTube. <laughs> subscribe. I've got to get that in, otherwise, yeah, yeah. otherwise they tie you up and, and hit you. So, the, um, I, I have a lot of expensive hobbies. So, I'm, I'm a um, trading card gamer. I play Magic the Gathering, Semi Pro, got a Lego addiction, um, video gaming, and I've got way more Pokemon Build a Bear plushies than a 38 year old should have. So, I think I've got eight of the Pokemon plushies. I've got all four of the starters Meowth, Jigglypuff. Psyduck and that, a giant Snorlax. Um, if you know what those are, congratulations, you're cool. Um, if you don't, sorry about your damn luck. And on um, Magic the Gathering, my biggest fear is that when I die, my guardian will sell my cards for what I told her I paid for them. Because um, she, she, I told her it was like $2,000 and that made her angry. So if she ever finds out that it's closer to 20, then I'm in, in a world of trouble. And I reckon this year alone, I spent about a grand on Lego. And just to put that in context, it's February 8th. <laughs> just so it's all clear how big this problem is. And I, I buy the actual sets. And then you make them. Then yeah, yeah. And, then yeah. Come, and then it's display Lego. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm going to, when I leave, I'm going to check if I got it in stock. There's a, a grand piano set. Not an actual grand, like... Not a real size, yeah, but... Yeah. You, but you can pair it with your phone using okay. the power up elements and play it like a real piano oh, nice. and the noise will come out your phone. And that's, I think it's 350. Lego's expensive. There's also like an Eiffel Tower that's like a meter and a half tall once you've built it. It's 10,001 bits and that's nearly 600. There's a Titanic that's around 600. Lego, if you're watching this, just send, just send me shit, please. No. Is there, what's the biggest Lego bit you own then? Oh, um, in terms of piece counts, I've got the, the world map that's loads of little one by ones stuck on the 16 by 16 tiles. And I, it's just over 11,000 bits. How long does that take you to make? A week. Well, I was recovering from surgery. And so Simon from the Grunt would get sent it to me as if I could get well soon thing. And I worked on it full, like, a full time job hours for five days. And, and hammered it out. My thumbs were bleeding by the end of it because you're literally just going. Was it worth it? Oh, totally. Totally worth it. And then the globe took 40 hours because that's really complex. You've got to make a steer out of something that's traditionally flat. So, from an engineering point of view, the globe and the typewriter are the hardest things I've done. Other brand uh, recently, this is going to sound really weird. Um, I I um injured my jaw around Christmas. I had to go on like a liquid diet for a while, and I tried this the Huel stuff, and I'm like, you know what? This isn't bad. I feel really healthy and really like fantastic. I got really like lean and like lost tons of weight. And then I, then the doctor went, I can eat again, and I put it all back on in like three days. And um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an apple whore. I'm, 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 just, I'm just trapped in that ecosystem now, and it's, I think it's too late to leave. Um, all my computers, Sony and Nintendo, have a lot of my money. Um, weirdly, Ted Baker. I love my Ted Baker trainers and, and blazers. I'm a, I'm a real fashion fashion guy, all, all my friends now think I'm pretentious and so I'm sort of playing up to it like a little bit now with sort of like the, the dress and, and what have you and then all these like group chats I'm in like I'm a massive pro wrestling fan I've just spent way too much money on O2 tickets because they're coming on July 1st and they were like, oh, is anyone watching a wrestling tonight? And I was like, no, I'm at a film premiere with Sebastian Stan sent photo. And I'm like, of course, of course you fucking are. Of course you are. And like, this is why we make fun of you. I'm like, I know, I know, I'm sorry. 
I wish I could not be that guy. Though so, uh, states have had different plans for me, and I have become that guy.